Pastor Jeff Noble, and I want to thank you for watching today. At Four Winds Church, we're kind of a simple church. We believe the Bible is God's Word, and we think that we should pay attention to it. And I hope that you will pay attention to it as you watch this video, because it's all about Jesus. of God's Word to Lamentations. Lamentations? What in the <laughs> world is that? Well, obviously from the word Lamentations, it probably sounds familiar to, to an English word called lament. What does lament mean? Complain. What's that? Complain. Well, not necessarily complain, but, but to, 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 to cry out, to, to be, you know, to be, to, be, to be passionate, to be bothered by something. Jeremiah even though he's not identified as the author, I believe that he is, wrote this about 575 B.C. And he wrote it, he wrote the Book of Lamentations. There's basically five laments uh, in, the, in the Book of Lamentations. But he wrote it because the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, had become so sin-filled and unrepentant uh, so anyway, uh, but Jeremiah was burdened, and so he calls out to God. But in this particular chapter, he sounds like he's complaining. And that's where I understand, you know, where you might think that word is to lament means to complain. But in the original text, it's, it's just sorrowful and, and, and burdened. If you start in Lamentations chapter 3, Jeremiah says this, beginning verse 1. He says, I am a man who has, been affl who has seen affliction. Go down to verse 2. He has driven me away and made me walk in darkness. Who is he? God, according to Jeremiah. Go down to verse 5. He has besieged me and surrounded me with bitterness and hardship. Verse 6. He has made me dwell in darkness like those long dead. I'm feeling really good. What about you? You know. <laughs> Verse eight. Even when he calls, uh, even when I call out and cry for help, he shuts out my prayers. He, he. Verse nine. He has barred my way with blocks of stone. He has made my paths crooked. He's saying all these things that God has done, but it's not God that has burdened his heart. It's the people of Israel. And he's saying, God, I've been praying for these folks, and I've been preaching to these folks, and I've been telling these folks. And they're not willing to turn away from their sin. And consequently, God, that burdens my heart. Verse 17, I have been deprived of peace. I have forgotten what prosperity is. He says, I am bummed. <laughs> But what I want to share with you is where we get down beginning in verse 18 and following. So I say, this is Jeremiah, my splendor is gone and, and all that I had hoped from the and, and all that I had hoped from, from the Lord. Verse 19. I remember my afflictions and my wandering, my bitterness and the gall. I will remember them and my soul will be down, downcast within me. So again, he's just he's just Rip, his heart's been ripped open by the lack of, of interest from the people that should have known better, the Jewish people. Verse 21. Yet this I call to mind. What's he saying? I'm going to remember. He says, therefore, he says, yet this I will call to mind, and therefore I have hope, because the Lord's great, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassion never fails. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait on him. The Lord is good to those who hope, whose hope is in him, to the ones who seek him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Today we're going to talk about a man who was terribly upset, but then he got to a place where he said, you know what, 
I can't continue to stay in this in this quagmire of sadness. I can't continue to be all bummed out and all depressed and all feeling bad about and, and, and thinking things. I have got to remember what God has promised me and put my hope back in Him. Mm -hmm. And that's my challenge for you and I today. Before we go any further, would you pray with me? Father God, it's in the name of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit that I ask that you would just teach us this text. And God, let us know that great is your faithfulness, the Lord unto thee. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The first thing I want to point out to you is that Jeremiah starts out by responding to God. That's the first thing. Jeremiah responds. Look what it says in verse 18. I say my splendor is gone and all that I had hoped for from the Lord. He says, man, I am as low as a snake's belly. I am bummed, I am burdened, I am broken, but I'm going to get better. He starts out by responding. First of all, he explains that he's, he's discouraged. We all get that way, don't we? I went to the Republican State Convention yesterday and spent the day with some knuckleheads. Hey. Hey, no. uh, well... <laughs> well, that was, and I don't mean, I don't, that sounds horrible when I said that because Alex was there and, and about a dozen of our church members were all there. It was so cool to see that, you know, our church walking around and being a part of that. But there was a lot of flesh going on and there was a lot of silliness going on. There was a lot of craziness going on. We all see this day in and day out. It would be so much simpler if folks just say, you know, what would God have us do? What, would, what should we do Amen. in the eyes of the Lord? But no, 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 no. It's discouraging to see people run after the flesh. It's discouraging to see people follow things that really don't yes. matter. Yes. Jeremiah said, man, if the people would just repent and turn back to God, things would clear up. I believe that now in the United States. Yes. If we just turn back to God and repent, things would clear up. He was discouraged. The Bible would tell us, and let me just share this with you, because Jeremiah uses words like affliction and darkness and broken bones and bitterness and woe. He shuts out my prayer. He blocks my, he blocks my ways. My soul sinks. I mean, he says all this really dark, terrible stuff. And yet I'm reminded what the Bible says, that a cheerful heart is good medicine. Now, we're not saying that you just should have the, the, the power of positive thinking. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a child of God who is saturated with the Word of God and, and filled with the Holy Spirit of God. They will look at a situation when everybody else is running for cover. You stand up and you say, I am at peace. A cheerful heart. Not a false, positive kind of thing, but a serious, filled, God-filled heart says, I, that is a good thing. To look at a situation and say, God, I know that you've got this under control. But a crushed spirit... Well, that just drives us to bones. That eats us up. That tears us up. We don't like that at all. Jeremiah was discouraged because the people that he loved were not responding to the Lord. He was discouraged. And he was also depressed. Now, I'm going to touch on a subject right now that some folks call taboo. We don't want to talk about depression. We don't want to interact with depression. But can I tell you something? One in three Americans struggle with depression. Think about that for a second. One in three Americans have had some form of depressive situation in their life. Many years ago, a young Midwestern lawyer suffered from deep depression. He and his friend, and his friends were so concerned about him, they actually hid all the knives in the household. They were concerned that he was going to hurt himself. During this time, he wrote this down. He says, I am now the most miserable man alive. Whether I shall even be better, I cannot tell. I awfully forebode, I shall not. He was wrong. He did recover. And became one of the greatest presidents of the United States, Abraham Lincoln. Oh, praise the Lord. Abraham Lincoln. We don't think of him that way. I did a little study here. Depression is a mental disease. It is a disease. 
It's, pro, it's, it, it, it's shown by prolonged sadness, frustration, anxiety. Most people suffer with depression, don't seek medical attention. And I will tell you, hear me on this church, if you struggle with depression, there are treatments available to you. And if you try to tell me that that's not of God, you are wrong. Don't, I've had people tell me, say, say, Pastor, people just have to have a stronger faith. They just have to believe more in Jesus. Listen, it's a medical condition. So don't beat up on anybody and don't make anybody feel bad about the fact that they struggle with depression. It is a disease. Let me give you some statistics. Depression among adults uh, tripled during the months following 2020. Why was that? Because of COVID. Jumping from 8.5% to 27.8% during the pandemic. We've seen it. We saw it firsthand. According to the National Institute of Mental Health, an estimated 21 million adults in the United States had at least one major depressive episode. This number represents 8.4 of all U.S. adults. The prevalence of adults with major, major depressive episodes was highest among individuals 18 to 25, representing 17% of the U.S. population. Depressive episodes are higher among adult females. 10.5% compared to males, 6.2%. Depression is the number one cause of suicide. Depression also weakens your immune system, makes you vulnerable for physical, physical disease. Listen to this. An estimated 4.1 million adolescents ages 12 to 17 in the United States had at least one <coughs> major depressive episode. <coughs> That number represents 17% of the U.S. population ages 12 to 17, higher among adolescent females again. 25.2% compared to males, 9.2%. Depression exists. But friends, it is treatable, and there are ways in which you can address that. Do not, do not think that you can just suck it up and handle it. I have struggled with depression in my own life. So understand that it's not a spiritual thing. It is a physical thing. And you must take it seriously. Job would say, what strength do I have that I should hope? Now, he had all these guys around him trying to, quote, encourage him, right? You know the story of Job? Job lost everything. He's bummed out. He's, 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 he's just, I mean, he's sitting in a dung heap covered with sores and just nasty. And his friends are just telling him, Job, you did something stupid to cause that problem. He goes on, he says, what prospect that I should be patient? In other words, what have I got to hope for? A despairing man, look at this. A despairing man should have the devotion of his friends, even though he forsakes the fear of the Almighty. He says, I should have people around me. He says, but my brothers are as undependable as intermittent streams. As a stream that overflows with, uh, when darkened with falling ice and swollen with melting snow, but, the, but cease to flow in the dry season, in the heat they vanish in the channels. You know what he's saying there? He said, some of my friends in my life are sort of like these streams. They got all kinds of, of water and all kinds of resources there sometimes, and then when things get tough, they evaporate. Job says, I need friends around me that can encourage me. <clears throat> friends, we all need friends around us that can encourage us. Jeremiah was depressed. And he told God that. And it's okay to tell God that you're struggling. It is okay to say, God, I am hurting right now. Because the funny thing is, he already knows. He just wants you to come and rely on him. Now, some of you are sitting here and they say, Pastor, life has never been better. Life has never been That's great. Praise God. I, hallelujah. But as you've heard me say many times, to be forewarned is to be forearmed. And we know those days will come. And you're going to want people to gather around you and encourage you. And I pray that we as a church will be sensitive to that brother or sister comes and says, I am hurting. 
hope our response will always be, let me help. Let me help. Jeremiah says, I have been deprived. Of, or he says, uh, verse 18, he says, my splendor is gone and all that I had hoped for from the Lord. He says that he was just bummed out. Jeremiah was responding. But the same thing is, Jeremiah remembers. That's the next thing I want to point out to you. Look what it says in verse 20. <clears throat> 21. Yet to this I call to mind and therefore have hope. Now, think about this for a second. He could have stayed in his misery. He could have continued to bask in his frustration, his depression, whatever it happened to be. He could have stayed right there and had a big case of what I call the poor me's, right? You've heard that before. Oh, woe is me. Oh, things are so bad. It's never going to get any better. It's always going to be terrible. Oh, blah, 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 blah. I hear people like that even now, man. Oh, the world's going uh, down the tube, and it's just so terrible, and I can't stand it, and it's never going to get any better, and on and on and on. And then I think, yet I will, this I will call to mind. Look what it says. Yet this I call to mind, for therefore I have hope. Did you hear what he said? Yes, I was depressed. Yes, I was discouraged. Yes, I was downtrodden. But! I will have hope. And he begins to remember. Verse 22. Because of the Lord's great love. We are not consumed. Think about that for a second. You got out of bed this morning. And put your feet on the ground. Because of God's great love. You could have just as easily gone into eternity in the middle of the night. And hopefully you know Christ and you would have been in our glory. But you got up this morning and placed your feet on the ground. Because of God's great love. Jeremiah says, you know, we deserve to be consumed. We deserve to have the wrath of God be poured out on us because we're not an obedient people. That's what he's talking about here. And yet God still chose to love us in spite of, in spite of the things that we do. Yesterday at the convention, I had a dear brother walk up to me and he says, I, I was blown away by the number of folks that actually watch our church online. I, I, I could not believe the folks at the convention that came and said, yeah, we follow you guys. We watch your services online. We watch your services on YouTube. I, I, was, I was so humbled. But I had a dear brother walk up to me. He says, man, I'm so excited about your, your Easter service, you know, Easter Sunday service. You had 220 people come through the, the doors that day. He said, that was exciting. He says, that church is doing well in spite of you. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, hallelujah, amen. <laughs> he was joking. He's a dear friend. I think he was joking. Maybe he was. I don't know. But, uh, but it was just funny. He said, so, I'm so excited to see what happened. That church is growing. In spite of you. I mean, uh, it was great. He's, they're actually going to be here today at the 11 o'clock service, Aww. they said, so that'll be fun. Uh, I just won't point them out to you. <laughs> but look at this, because of the Lord's great love, that, 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 that word great love is a, is a wonderful, wonderful word here. It, it means, this word has said, it means the idea of loyal love. What is loyal love? Loyal love sticks beside you. It stays there, even when things go bad. I was talking to a person one time, and they were telling me about a family member of theirs that the, the woman got sick, and, and the husband looked at her and said, I, I just can't stay in this situation. I'm leaving you. And she, she died alone because of this, this guy. That's not has said. That's not great love. That's not loyal love. Loyal love stands beside even in the difficult situations. Jeremiah says, it is because of your great love that we are not consumed. Matthew Henry said, as bad as things are, it is owing to the mercy of God that they are not worse. That is right. When I would walk into the hospital room and see my bride, I walked by many hospital rooms before I ever got there, and I saw a lot of other things going on. Bad situations, difficult situations. There's always worse. Jeremiah says, we are not consumed. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. I love that verse. 
We actually sing that as in a in song. A steadfast spirit. A loyal, steadfast heart that says, I will not be shaken. I will not be moved. Jeremiah remembers that God's love renders compassion. Because of your great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. God's compassions, Raham, it means to wound. It means to protect. It means to, to, to hold close and, and gentle. Just like a baby in a mother's womb, it's protected in there. The mother can take, take a, a lot of difficulties, but that baby is, is protected. And, that's the same kind of thumb. That, that compassion that God holds on to us and says, I will not walk away from you. I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. John 15, 16, you did not choose me, God says, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. You know what he's saying is? That life that I gave you, I want you to go out and live it for me. Go out and share the message of Christ and show the love of God and be faithful even in the difficulty situations. He said, that's what fruit is. To have success in life based on God's leading. And the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. That peace and that love and all those things that you desire. That lifting up out of that depressive state. Jeremiah says God's love renders compassion. But also God's love remains consistent. Look what it says. Because of your great love, we are not consumed for his compassion never fails. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. What does it mean the mercies are new every morning? If God held against you what you did yesterday, today, then those mercies would not be new every morning. Okay. His grace, you know, his unmerited favor, he loves us and provides for us. But his mercy is that he withholds what we quite frankly deserve by our disobedience. And he does it every single day. The consistency of God is is, 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 is amazing. Look what it says. They are new every morning. Remember back when the nation of Israel was out in the desert and they were hungry, they wanted food, and God says, all right, good. I'm going to give you some manna. I'm going to give you this special kind of stuff and it would come down and lay on the ground and they would go out and they'd pick it all up. And he says, but I want you just to collect enough for today. Now what did people do? What's the human nature, right? Human nature is, let's get a whole bunch. And we'll save it, we'll stockpile it, we'll hoard it. I always got to be careful when I say hoard in church. We get it all together, we'll hold it close and all that kind of stuff, and, and what happened? It would spoil by the next day. Because God says, I want you to get just enough one day. The consistency of God, every day I provide you what you need that particular day. Every day I provide you with the mercy and the grace that you need for that day. God's consistent. He doesn't waffle back and forth. He doesn't do that. Why? Because his he is faithful. He says, he says, great is your faithfulness. I love what it says here, Micah chapter 3, verse 6. I, the Lord, do not change. So you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. You know why he said that? He said, I made you a promise that I would provide for you, and I'd watch over you. Promise he's made you and I too. I'm not going to let you just hang out there in the wind. If you want to be out in the wind, that's up to you. But he says, I am going to be consistent because I don't change, he says. What about this? Psalm 130, verse 7. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for within the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption, that bind back of our soul that is condemned to hell apart from Christ. <laughs> Jeremiah remembers he says, and they're new to the greatest your faith. I say to myself, my Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait on him. That brings me to the last verse here. Jeremiah replies, and he says, I said to myself, not like he's talking to himself, but he's reassuring what he already knows. You know, sometimes it's good. We know it in our head. But sometimes i got to tell myself verbally. God is in the midst of this. God has got my, God is going to give me strength. God is going to provide. God, I know that you're going to get us through this situation, whatever it is. God, I know you're going to provide. It's okay to verbalize that. When Jeremiah says, I said to myself, 
He said, I was just reaffirming what he knew about God. What's the first thing he says there? The Lord is my portion. That word portion means allotment or inheritance. It's the word kelek. What does that mean? It means that everything you need is contained in the Lord. The breath you have in your lungs. We were talking before Cheryl's brother is in town and he's dealing with cancer. A few spots of cancer. The Lord is his portion. The Lord is going to do everything that he needs to have done to deal with that situation. Whether he heals him or whether he just provides him peace in the midst of that, of that illness. Whatever it is, the Lord is his portion. You and I have got to remember the Lord has given us everything that we need for life and love and, and carrying on. And it's okay to say that out loud. The Lord is my portion. Say it with me. The Lord is my portion. He is my inheritance. He is the one that allows us to carry on. He is the one that says, I am not going to leave you ever. We will lose many things in this life, but we will not lose the Lord. Why? John chapter 10, verse 10. Jesus says, I have come to give you what? Life. And give it to you what? Abundantly. If he comes to give us life and give us to us abundantly, that means he's not going to just pat our little backsides and say, go, go do your thing. I guess I can say backside in church, can I? I didn't say but, so it's good. <laughs> my flesh, Psalm 73, verse 26, my flesh and my heart will fail. <laughs> what does he mean? I get tired. You get tired? I get tired. My flesh sometimes, the, 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 the flesh that is the human aspect of me. By the way, you can use humanity as an excuse, but my Bible says I was made a new creation. You were made a new creation as well. The old is gone, the new has come. Don't use the fact that you are just human and justify lust and bad behavior and all the sin. He says, my flesh and my heart may fail. Well, he says, but God and his strength of, of my heart and my portion forever. God is, my, is the strength of my heart. He says, I'm not going to let the fit flesh dictate how I respond. I'm going to let the spirit of God that dwells within me lead me and guide me and direct me. Why? Because the Lord is my portion. He is everything that we need. We need. And look what else he says. Not only is the Lord, not only does he say the Lord is my portion, but he also says the Lord is my provider. Look, I will say to myself, the Lord is my portion. I will wait for him. What does that mean? Have you ever gotten ahead of God? No. <laughs> yeah, I knew you'd say that. No, I, I, I knew you were joking, by the way, Mom. I appreciate it. I think we all have sometimes. You've heard me tell the story that we got called to a church. We were starving to death in seminary. We got called to a church in our hometown. And, and I just knew that was God. And so I told Mark, I said, you go pray and I'll go pack. <laughs> And uh, we went down there, and it was a train wreck. Uh, it was terrible, because I got ahead of God. I didn't seek his counsel. I didn't seek his wisdom. I just looked at a quick out, and I thought, it, and I knew it was of God, and it was just an absolute nightmare for two years in that church. <coughs> we get ahead of, ahead of God. We need to wait on him sometimes. Why? Because he is the provider. If I had waited on now God used it, and I'm not going to complain about it, because even though we had to go through a bunch of things, God still used it for his glory and for for the benefit of my family. My girls were all very sick. First six months of their lives, they were in the hospital all the time. And so for like a five-year period there, we were in the hospital almost every month with one of them. And we had a ton of the, our bills, our, our medical bills out of pocket were over 100 grand. That was back in the, in the forever ago, 90s. And I didn't know how we were to pay it. And we were paying five bucks on every bill. You know how you do that? You had 30 bills, you're paying five bucks. And that was still killing us. I mean, we're just, we were just drowning in debt. Getting the calls and the letters, you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And I, the whole time, I'm like, God, you know, I came, and, and I knew I, I, I knew that I had made a mistake. The pastor was, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but God still used it because in the midst of that, we had a doctor come to us and said, "We, I work at the hospital where you guys have been, and I, I found out what you owe." Hmm. 
and we know that you paid off about forty thousand of the sixty of the hundred thousand dollars, and some of my doctor friends are going to pay the rest off. Wow. Wow. So, so, so even though we had to walk through the valley of the shadow of death, <laughs> God still used it, and we're very grateful. And I, I pray for those those doctors even now, because they said we see. That God can provide for God has provided for them. So he says, we're going to provide for someone else. The Bible tells that's for me. I watch in hope for the Lord. I wait for God, my Savior. My God will hear me. Micah says, I am not going to get excited, and I am not going to get distracted. What does it mean to wait on the Lord? Exactly what it means. I'm going to trust God to give me an answer and give me a direction and then move forward. You know people make the biggest mistake? In relationships. They get ahead of God in relationships. They just want to be out of mom and dad's house so they get married. And then it's a train wreck. Or they just want to be they just want sorry. They just want to be, you know, I just I just just want to be on my own. And they find somebody. I tell everyone the same thing, wait on God. Wait on God. Because when you wait on God, then it comes exactly the way He wants it, and then there's peace. And there's joy in all those things. Because the Lord provides. One more verse. Taste and see the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. The Lord is the provider. Final thing I want to point out to you, Jeremiah. I say the Lord is his promise. Look what it says. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him. To the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. All of the things that Jeremiah was feeling earlier, he still felt. But then when he said, look, I've got promises that God has given me. That is what I'm going to cling to. That is what I'm going to hold to. That is what is important. And when he began to do that, it's still, I mean, Lamentation is still, it's not, it's not an uplifting book at all. But you know what that allowed Jeremiah to do? Keep moving forward. Even in the midst of his depression, even in the midst of his discouragement, even in the midst of the distraction of the people, Jeremiah continued to rely on the promises of God. Can I tell you something? You and I need to do the same thing. You and I need to do the exact same thing. If I sit around and look at everything that's going on around me, like you, I'd explode. Trusting in the promises and knowing that the Lord is in the midst of our, we're in the midst of God's will and God is leading us in the midst of his, his purpose and his plan. It allows us to continue to put one step in front of the other. As long as we have life. And that's all he's asking us to do, right? Continue on the mission that he placed us here for. Go make disciples. To baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and to teach them to remember everything that Christ taught us, Matthew 28, 19, and 20. In my alarm, I said, I have cut off from your sight, yet you heard my cry for mercy when I called to you for help. Jeremiah was fussing that God wasn't hearing his prayers, but God would eventually respond. Jeremiah never saw fruit in his ministry. But God still blessed his faithfulness. Don't get discouraged. Don't get downtrodden. Don't get depressed. Just keep moving forward in the power of the Lord. I share with you this story and I'm going to close. There was a man who was a, a diver. He jumped off of diving boards, which I think is absolutely insane. <laughs> Those really high ones, you know, way, way up in the... Anyway, he was training for the Olympics. And one night he decides to go into the pool area. The lights were off. It was a night he didn't know how to turn them on, but there was enough moon kind of shining through the windows and everything that he was able to see okay. And he climbed up on top of one of those really high, like 30 meter boards or something like that. He got up there and the diving board was like there, and he was going to do one of these backflips. You know, he gets up there and gets on the side. He holds his hands up like this. And there was just enough light that shone through. And on the wall behind him, 
He saw a cross. Mm. Now, the interesting thing about this guy, he was an atheist. And there was a guy that had been trying to share with him on the swim team, you know, the diving team. Hey, you got no Jesus, got no Jesus, got no Jesus. And the guy was never interested, never interested, never interested. For some reason, when he stood on that board and held his arms like that, I saw that cross. Mm -hmm. It's like all that truth just came into his heart. And he knelt down right there on that 30-meter board and said, Oh, God, forgive me. Come into my life, and I want to live my life for you from this day forward. And as he's getting up, maintenance guy came in and flipped on the lights. And the guy turned around and looked down and the pool had been emptied for repairs. And had he done a backflip, it had been into an empty pool. Can I tell you something? I think there are people that are standing right here on the edge of the board ready to get ready to jump. And that dive they're about to make could be their last. Why not look to the cross and staring you right in the face and say, I am going to remember. And I am going to rejoice in what I have in Christ Jesus. Great is your faithfulness, Lord, unto thee. Let's pray. Friend, I know it's easy to become discouraged. But Jesus did tell us in this life you will have trouble, but understand I have overcome this world. God has been faithful. Lord, we thank you so much for the fact that you have not given up on us. And though sometimes we may speak and feel like nobody's listening, we may share with friends and family and they mock us and laugh. But God, you remind us that you are faithful. That we don't need to be discouraged or depressed. But we need to delight in your truth. Father, we can remember all that you have done, how you provided for us over and over again. And let us respond with thanksgiving and God, we can look at our situation and let it drag us down. But we can rise above it in the power of the Holy Spirit and be seen as one who is faithful because of your great faithfulness. Lord, I would ask that you would help us every day to keep our eyes focused on you. Remember these things that Jeremiah said, yet I will remember this. That your love is great. That your mercies are new every morning. That you are our portion and our promise. God, there is great joy in that. May we never, may we never lose sight of that. In Jesus' name. This is Pastor Jeff Noble, and I want to thank you for tuning in. You know, the Bible tells us that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The world started with God saying, this is the way that I want it. And then when he created us, he said, you know what? I want you to be a certain way too. I want you to worship me. I want you to follow me. I want you to love me. And God gave us that opportunity. But man was sinful. Man was dis disobedient. And consequently, man just did his own thing. But God said, I'm going to make a way that you can have eternal life. I'm going to send my son so that you can know that your sins are forgiven and that there's a home awaiting you in heaven. That man was Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He lived a sinless life for 33 years and died on a cross for your sins and for mine. If you'd like more information about that, please come and check out Four Winds Church. We're all about Jesus Christ. If you want more information, you can go to fourwindslove.org and check us out there. In the meantime, think about it. If you were to die right now, where would you spend eternity? I hope it's in heaven, and I hope it's because you know Christ. Come see us at Four Winds Church at 31840 West Seven Mile Road in Livonia. God bless you.